done any human interview here with your boss. Yeah. And I'm not talking about Liz. Hey, Robert. Hey, Andre. Good to see you after this uh, few years. Yeah. So you have to repeat my question. Yes, Andre. Who are you and what's your mission in life? Uh, Andre, my name is Robert Laporte, and my mission in life is helping people create dignified shelter. So my background is in forestry. My background is in forestry and in teaching transcendental meditation and building. So specifically. I am a log builder and timber framer. That's my background. Since when? Since uh, late 70s. So about 40, almost 40 years ago is when I started my apprenticeship into carpentry. When and how did you discover building biology? I, w I discovered, well, first I was going to tell you how I discovered building first. So that's just a little short, short uh, story. But I was training to be a teacher of transcendental, transcendental meditation in Huntsville, Ontario. And at that time, there was a handcrafted log house that was built next door to the meditation center. And I, I discovered this building just after it was newly erected and it really spoke to me. It was the most beautiful building I'd ever seen in my life. And you know, I realized after being in this building for a couple of hours with nobody around, just nature, a nice, beautiful day, I realized that this was why I was on, this is why I was born. It was to learn how to build this way of building. And I, a month later, I started my apprenticeship as a log builder. Fast forward, how did I discover building biology? That came place in 1988. When I made the decision that I did not, no longer wanted to enclose the timber frame buildings I was handcrafting at that time with foam insulated panels, plastic foam stress skin panels is how timber frames are commonly insulated today, and they were insulated at that time in the early 80s. So I made the decision I didn't want to use chemicals in my buildings and toxic materials in my buildings. So I started looking for an alternative, and that led me to building biology, and that led me to go to Europe and meet Dr. Anton Schneider, the founder of Building Biology. And you traveled around Europe a lot? Tell me about this technique. It's like a straw bale. It's a lot older. Uh, thank you, Andre. So this particular technique that we practice is called light straw clay. The German word is Leichlembau, which means light clay building. The difference between light straw clay and straw bale is simply that the straw in, is coated with clay. Straw bale is a mason, in some ways it's a masonry building system that it uses straw bales like building blocks and you maintain the bale shape and you stack it up like building blocks. And once the bales are stabilized, then they are finished on both interior and exterior faces with plaster or, or different finishes. Straw clay is different. It's a wet technique whereby powdered or granular clay is first liquefied and then it is mixed with loose straw so that all the straw is lightly coated. When you see the process behind me, you see you can still see the straw. And you can see that there's really is just a thin coating of clay 
over the straw. Is that helpful? So your comment that this looks very labor intensive and how long does it take to do a 1500 square foot house? Initially, when we first started doing straw clay without any experience, it would take us four weeks to do the straw clay walls for a 1500 square foot building. Today, it takes us about four days to do the same walls under ideal conditions. Yes. So the process is basically has two phases. One is building the matrix, and the matrix is a light wooden framework that cages the clay straws. So that means basically creating a framework into which or onto which a formwork system can be employed that allows you to take this loose mixture of clay and straw and fill in the framework and compact it. So that's called filling. And once the framework is filled with the clay straw and compacted, the forms are removed so that the clay straw walls, typically 12 inches thick for an average resident in North America, can dry. In, in straw clay construction, there are five divisions and those of you who have seen the new Econest book, this is fully explained. The five divisions of straw clay consist of production, which you see taking place behind me, where the clay is liquefied and then combined in a tumbling device called a tumbler, where it is, the straw gets coated, and then the straw is loaded into boxes, which are called hoppers. So all of this operation of flipping and tumbling is called production. That's one division. The second division of straw clay is how do you get this mixture to the building? So that division is called delivery. And the hoppers that you see as behind that you see behind me here are designed to be lifted with a forklift which carries 6 to 800 pounds of straw clay to the walls of a building, or in this case, in Bobby's house, to a, an assembly area where the clay straw will be installed in modular panels here off site. So this is called delivery. The third division of clay straw is called framing, whereby a timber frame or a hybrid timber frame and load-bearing wall system is framed to receive the clay straw mixture. This, all of the carpentry that takes place to create this framework, this we call this matrix, all of that carpentry collectively is known as framing, the framing division. So those are three divisions. The fourth division is a formwork system consisting of inside forms or inner formwork, full forms, and, and outside partial forms, which are called flip forms, which then allow us to form the framework in preparation for the final phase known as filling. So the fifth division is filling, where we take this mixture of moist, sticky, loose straw clay, install it into the, into the formed framework and compress it by jumping on it and tamping it with wooden tampers. And that completes the wall. The filling takes place in two foot, in, two foot increments in, uh, when we build clay straw walls on site. This is a little different adaptation here, which I'll comment on separately in a moment. So in review, the five divisions of clay straw are production, delivery, framing, forming, and filling. Tell me a bit about the R value and the comfort with the mass. In full climate, where, 
we were beginning to deal more and more with double set laws. Our 30, our 40, and wow. our 60 was falling apart. So the question that's been asked now is, what is the thermal performance? What is the R value of a clay straw wall? The R value is a pro depending upon the density of the mixture, the, de the R value of clay straw will vary from 1.6 to 1.8 on average. And that's for densities of clay straw that are starting at a very low density of 15 pounds a cubic foot to double that 30 pounds a cubic foot. So the higher R values are attained with the lighter densities and the lower R values with the higher densities. So additionally, so a 12 inch wall with a medium density, 20 to 25 pound density wall will have an R value of approximately 20 for a 12 inch wall, which is sufficient for the temperate climate region of the world, not just in Northern Ontario, but around the world, north and south of the equator. This building method has been used around the world in temperate climates. One, Ottawa is a cold climate, and a 12-inch thick wall is sufficient for straw. Uh, excuse me, for this climate that you have here. There's more to the total performance of a home than just the walls, as you know. But I want to touch briefly on the mass factor. So we've only talked about the the R factor. So clay straw is not only insulating, but it, it, it also has weight and density and mass. And that's the contribution of the clay. On average, there is 10 to 20 pounds of clay per cubic foot of wall. And approximately a constant is the straw, which is about 8 pounds per cubic foot uh, for any given wall. That pretty much stays the same. So there you see... Uh, the range. The, this mass effect is very important for temperate climate. Temperate climate region is characterized by four seasons and has a summer, a we'll say a real summer and a real winter. You require you require cooling in the summer to be comfortable. You require heating in the winter to be comfortable to be, let's say, 68 degrees on average. So Ottawa, interestingly enough, I learned today, the biggest energy loads in Ottawa come in the summer when you have high air conditioning. Uh, a lot of air conditioning goes on and you have what's called a, a, br you have a, a brownout that takes place where the electricity, there's not electricity for the city of Ottawa. I have experienced this in Toronto and there's not electricity in the summer. Everyone's running air conditioning. I've never seen the power go out other than uh, a snowstorm or an ice storm in, in Toronto. So, so how does this work, this mass? The way it works is mass can store energy. So when you slowly warm up a, an equinet, which has, on average, 30,000 pounds of clay in the perimeter wall, when that warms up, even though the the heating system, wherever, whatever that may be, we primarily heat with the masonry heater in our Equinet. So when that masonry heater fire is done, when it's gone, that source of heat is gone, the house doesn't instantly cool down, even though the heat is gone. And the reason is the mass stores that energy and continues to radiate it for up to even a week after. doesn't mean the house a week later will be 68 degrees, but it will probably be, see, still be 55 degrees. And only mass can do that. Insulation, lightweight insulation, does not store energy. So this combination of both insulation and mass 
creates what Europeans call dynamic insulation or massive insulation. This is the appropriate wall system for temperate climates, which Ottawa is a part of. All of Ontario is in the climate region. The northern, most northern parts of Ontario are in an Arctic, subarctic and Arctic climate region. And this is not appropriate for those regions. But most of where the population of Canada is, this is an appropriate building response. So that's a great question that was just asked. Why can you open doors and windows for ventilation in the wintertime in a house that has high mass? Well, I just basically, um, in the, I basically will just repeat what I just said. Mass stores energy. So if you have, if you have a house that has tons, excuse me just for a moment. So when you have when you have a house, a dwelling that has significant mass, tons of mass, you can we do this all the time in our homes. We've been doing this for twenty years in our homes. We can open in the wintertime, we can completely open the house up for ten, twenty minutes. And it it's beautiful to the house the house gets nice and warm and few minutes, the house is still warm. It's, it's just beautiful to be over. Um, and it's because the mass, the house hasn't cooled down. The air has been changed, but the walls have not been cooled down. So airtight makes, uh, airtight, constru airtight construction is very important today uh, because of the 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 need to conserve energy. Our plasters. That's why that's why an Econet will have an interior and exterior plaster to increase the air tightness of the house. The walls remain vapor diffuser, uh, diffusible. Yeah, uh, water vapor can still move through the wall, but air is resistant, so the house is not drafted. And the second part of your question was the way we seal around doors and windows typically is with wool insulation, sheet wool insulation. Yeah. Do we tape? Uh, the outside may have uh, a taping for the frame to the rough opening. Taping in the sense of um, this is more of a waterproofing system not uh, and it does contrib contribute to the tightness of the house these are not what we are currently building are not what we would call um, super tight passive house standard construction for for the walls we're not sealing the house hermetically sealing the house as in as in the passive house construction I would uh, yes, there have been blower door tests. I, I don't remember uh, the numbers right off the top of my head. Paula could certainly uh, answer that question. They're respectable. They're, they get very respectable values for that. Uh, I know they fell within the desired range, but it wasn't the range that Passive House is, is set. I know that. It's not that high. But I would say that those people that are engaged in Passive House is an excellent way to conserve energy and, and build uh, and build today. I love this uh, this way of building. And you can, we, uh, Econet has the goal of reaching those high performance values that Passive House has established using factory industrial building products. Econet is slowly moving towards a similar standard but using natural materials, using natural materials. Currently, this house here is moving, is a step in that direction. It's not all natural materials, 
but the um, yeah. Anyway, that's a whole other story. Let's keep it simple. Yes. So this adaptation of straw clay is about 50 years old. It, 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 The original techniques of clay straw date back over a thousand years in Europe and Asia. Yeah. And versions, different versions of building with fiber and clay soils can be found on all habited continents, uh, with the exception of habited. So I'm leaving out the Antarctic here. Um, but uh, South America, Africa, all of Asia, all of Europe, all of North America. Scandinavia, all of these countries have used clay and fiber for millennia, for thousands of years. The buildings that I researched in the past 30 years, both in Europe and Asia, date to 800 years in Germany and 1,200 years in Japan. Old, uh, in Japan. But these techniques have been around for a long time, but, but they what we do today has been modified to be lighter, more energy efficient. It's not as dense as the original Waddle and Bob or Fleschwerk and Stockton, as they would say in Germany. Another good question. This would be very similar uh, thermal performance as Hemp 2. Yeah, very similar. I like the low embodied energy. Why do I prefer uh, light straw clay versus hemp tree? One, one is uh, in the United States, hemp is not readily available. It's still illegal there. Uh, second is straw is a, is a free and abundant waste product uh, pretty much worldwide. Clay is just as it is, I'm looking at some on the ground over there, just as it is, clay is a natural cement that requires no more processing to functionally glue the straw together, and it has so many benefits. Clay is what's known in building biology as hygroscopic. That's one of the benefits. But what that means in simple terms is that clay has the ability to handle moisture in a I'm going to use the word diplomatic way in a very clever way. It takes, it sequesters, whenever you have moisture intrusion into a, a wall system, you have potential for degradation, you have potential for decay, potential for mold. So you have potentially a problem when moisture intrudes a wall that has no clay. When you introduce clay into any wall system, you now are putting in uh, an insurance policy into that wall system. Clay, when it, when, whenever moisture invades a location where clay is occupying that space, the clay will actually sequester. It will, it will hold, it, it captures the water, moisture in the environment, it's a, environment. It captures it and draws it into its own body. And then when the environment around it becomes dry again, it releases that moisture. So it literally dries out the surrounding environment. So when you have a wall that consists of wood, straw, and clay, and that wall gets wet, within 24 to 48 hours, clay has absorbed 95% of all the moisture in its environment. The wood is dry, the straw is dry, but the clay still has the water and it releases it slowly at a healthy rate of transmission to the environment. So, ah, very true, very true. So rock, soul, rock wool does not have, it has a low hydro capacity. It's higher than fiberglass insulation, but it's nowhere near clay. Clay is the king of hydro, uh, hygroscopic ability or the ability to, clay is like an ambassador. I think, I like to think of clay as an ambassador, a uh, friendly ambassador that, that uh, what's the word? It, um, it 
balances, that's the word. Clay balances your indoor climate. So it balances the moisture, it balances temperature, it balances acoustics, and it it has it has a energy. This is a little bit ooga booga here. I can't I can't scientifically uh, back up what I'm going to say in the next phrase, but but clay is alive. Clay still has a lively quality to it, especially if you don't fire it in a kiln. You harvest it and you preserve its abilities, its natural vibration. When you put this in a wall, or if you go in the earth, if you dug, went into a hole in the ground, a cave, dug up, and you went in that space, there'd be this still, quiet environment, beautiful space to meditate in. That changes when you fire that material at high temperature and make a brick. A brick vault doesn't have the same energetics. I don't know how to explain that scientifically, but I can tell you when I meditate, I go much deeper in a, in a natural environment than when I meditate in a man-made environment. So, whatever that's worth. Yeah. So it's healthy. It creates a healthy environment. And clay is like, for me, the Cadillac. It's like the Prius. <laughs> the Prius of natural materials. Yeah. Prius of building materials. Like wood. Like a tree. Like wood, clay, fiber, stone. These are like the... These are like the highest, the highest gift nature has given us. To take that and change it, to adulterate it, is in no way making something better. No way. We, we don't want to improve upon this million-year-old evolution and millions of years of clay. It takes millions of years to create. The factory that creates clay is a pollution-free factory. There's no pollution in nature. And when we take clay and we put it in the kill and we fire, we create pollution. We, we kill the fish in the rivers. We pollute the air that we breathe. You know, so, so that's really a very important thing to consider when you build a home. Well, what's the impact of what you do to your environment? What's the impact that you do to your body, to your mind, to your lungs? So when you build a house, at the very least, you should feel good at the end of the day. You should feel strong at the end of the day. You should reverse the aging process. Don't accelerate the aging process when you build something. Yeah. So it's a relationship that gives to you. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. So Andre just asked me to say a little bit about Japanese craftsmen who continue to work into their golden years. Many of the craftsmen that we have met in Japan are still practicing their craft after 60 years. 60 years, imagine. They're not 60 years old. They're 75, 80 years old. Yeah. And many younger, too. Many younger. But they have been doing something that is feeding them, that is nourishing them, something that they're proud of, something that their culture respects them for doing. They create something of lasting value. They create something beautiful, inspiring. Yeah. Nature is so kind, teacher, and wants the best out of each individual. Yvonne, he has a gift. He has a skill. He has a talent. And nature knows that. And nature shows him his gift. And he he cultivates that talent and serves his community. And it, and it gives him a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose. And, and he's at home. And so all of us have this, this wonderful gift, this beautiful gift. And when we discover that and develop that, we become alive. We really, we really, uh, we can be like Tocho said, we can be of service to our community. Well, first, next spring, 2017, um, June, we'll be in British Columbia teaching a workshop there in Sook, B.C. 
Uh, that just went on the boards last night uh, on our schedule. Um, Bob Powell's here. We're doing phase one, phase this fall right now. The next couple of weeks, we'll be completing a five to six week program here. And at that point, Bo Bo Bobby and Elizabeth will have the shell of their house ready to, um, uh, ready, well, it'll be at that, it'll stay at that stage until phase two happens next spring. Um, and at that point in time, he will have a team of trained uh, people here that will continue the, the creation of their sanctuary. I don't know that I will be here next summer. I'm, I feel right now very confident that this core group, just with Bobby, um, and especially with Kyle. Kyle, uh, I hope you interviewed Kyle, but Kyle is an Econest affiliate right now. This house will be uh, basically his, his give him his diploma. And with Kyle's skills and Bobby's team, they have what it takes to build Econest here in this region of Canada. Yeah, so this is inspiring. This is very, very inspiring to uh, teach, what do they say? Teach a man to fish, he could feed himself. So it's really inspiring to see the uh, enthusiasm of all the students here that are learning, yeah. So this will be a lighthouse. Bobby's creating a lighthouse for Ottawa and Eastern Canada. Yeah, this is a seed that's gonna grow into many good fruits. When the student is ready, the master appears. True. <laughs> yes, when the student is ready, the master appears. Yeah, so I'm a ready and willing student. <laughs> I'm halfway through my apprenticeship. Yeah, thank it's you. been good. It's been good, Andre. Thank you for coming from Montreal, and thank you for sharing all of this knowledge with our friends. Yeah, bonjour.